Good afternoon, happy midday, good morning to everyone. Welcome to the webinar IPv6 Strategy for the Development of the Region. My name is Kevin Swift. I'm Head of Strategic Relations and Integration here at Lactic, and I'll be accompanying you in this interactive activity. This webinar on IPv6 is geared towards the countries of Guyana, Suriname, and Belize so that we can contribute our experience and cooperate with efforts to significantly increase IPv6 deployment. We will talk about the current state of IPv4, i.e. its depletion, trends, and best practices in the deployment of IPv6, as well as the IPv6 strategy for the future development of the region. As for the mechanics of this webinar, we will have two parts. The first part will be conducted by Mr. Oscar Robles, Executive Director of LACNIC, and the second part will be done by Alejandro Costa, R&D Coordinator here at LACNIC, and our guest speaker, Brent McIntosh. At the end of each part, there'll be time for questions and answers. We can invite participants to post their questions and answers in the Q&A section of the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of the screen. So the Q&A section of the Zoom toolbar and not the chat section. We, the webinar is being recorded and will be published in the coming days on the LACNIC webinars webpage. So if you have any further thoughts about the topics presented here after this current session, please feel free to review the recording and reach out to us. Without further ado, we will start the activity right now with Mr. Oscar Robles. Oscar, over to you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to this uh, webinar. Let me share my screen um, so we can start. Uh, uh, with this presentation. So um, uh, could you confirm it that you're uh, watching the presentation? It's okay, yes. Oscar. Thank you. Well, um, as, um, uh, as you know, uh, for a few years, we've been uh, talking with some of you as uh, uh, the uh, uh, that uh, we have mentioned that the IPv6 is not uh, a technical decision anymore. Um, we've been in, in, in the region, uh, in some of the countries in the region, Caribbean, Central America, uh, mentioning some of the reasons uh, why we believe this is not an administrative decision anymore. So I'll try to answer some of the questions that you may have in this regard. So let me start uh, with the presentation. Um, First of all, um, probably you are wondering um, who is LACNIC and, uh, or uh, some of the people that you're talking to may be wondering who is LACNIC and why is in these uh, activities and in this role. Well, LACNIC is uh, one of the five uh, regional internet registries and uh, we are a non-for-profit, non-government membership-based organization established in Uruguay since 2002. We are uh, about uh, tomorrow, we actually may be turning 18 years of uh, uh, existence. Currently we have uh, 11,000 members in 30, 33 territories or economies in the region. And uh, uh, our membership uh, comprises uh, telecom operators, internet service providers, businesses, uh, academia, government offices, and end users. Uh, even though we have this uh, um, level of membership, we don't do, um, uh, I mean, uh, we don't represent their, their interest. We represent the internet uh, uh, fundamental principles and uh, um, th that's what uh, our uh, guidance is. So um, then what is uh, IPv6? Well, Every single device uh, on the internet, um, uh, whether it is a supercomputer, uh, smart uh, a smartphone, or a sensor of temperature in, uh, in an agricultural field in the uh, industry, it requires an internet address. So no matter what the size is, uh, if it is connected to the internet, it requires an IP address. Um, for many years, IPv4 was the original standard, and uh, it was the, for, uh, deployed for experimental purposes uh, back in the um, late 70s, uh, early 80s. The internet uh, uh, happens to have evolved in a different pace uh, what, uh, of what was originally envisaged by the 
uh, internet uh, uh, early uh, adopters. Uh, so they, they very quick we run out of space of this old IPv4 uh, protocol. The good news is that uh, uh, we have a, a, a new version of uh, this protocol, which offers the chance to connect every single device uh, on the internet. Uh, but there is a problem. Our region is doing a reasonable deployment, but on average, and that is a problem. As, as you know, average is, is always a problem when you talk about uh, these kind of uh, statistics. Uh, why is that a problem? How is the region de deploying IPv6 on, uh, in, on end users? Um, well, uh, in, in, uh, globally, the IPv6 has uh, uh, roughly one uh, one every 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 three um, packets on the internet one is uh, ipv6 already in the region is uh, one out of uh, every four packets uh, one is uh, ipv6 so that could be a good news for the region but the problem the problem is that this is uh, always an average so you may have some countries with good level of deployment the the, the ones in uh, black letters, uh, they have pretty much a good level of deployment. But then you have the ones in red with a, a very low level of uh, deployment. Then if you pay attention to um, Guyana's, um, uh, French Guyana, Suriname and Guyana, that, that is even, uh, uh, that, that has a lot of uh, differences and uh, that represents the, the problem that we have in the whole region. Some countries have a good level of deployment. Some one, some others are, have a very low, and some others uh, they, they they haven't even started to deploy the, the IPv6, like in this case Guyana. Um, in the case of French Guyana, it happens uh, in this uh, in this way. It happens to be the the, the country with the greatest uh, um, level of deployment because it is a small network. And uh, uh, once they are starting to do something, it, uh, it really notices. Uh, so um, that, that is a good, good thing, but it may uh, change uh, very, very soon if uh, uh, they, they don't sustain that uh, deployment. In any case, uh, you can see here the uh, links to, to all these resources to see how is the, um, the deployment of um, IPv6. Um, so why is uh, then uh, why is uh, IPv6 uh, um, uh, deployment uh, strategic uh, for all the uh, players in the industry? Well, this is the reason number one. For uh, sometimes we have mentioned this to, to some of you that uh, um, back in the 2012 there was a hack to the uh, Trinidad and Tobago Parliament Internet uh, web page. Um, today, uh, the, perpet the perpetrators of this crime have not been found due to, to the impossibility to trace them. And that is uh, something uh, mostly related to the uh, impossibility to uh, track the transactions in IPv4, the current uh, protocol. Um, so, um, Transaction traceability is a fundamental criteria for internet security, but also for the internet users' trust. So as long as you may have the chance to trace this, this kind of um, uh, transactions, you may have both security, but also the trust from the users. Uh, IPv6 allows for this uh, um, traceability of transactions. Uh, that uh, returns the operator the, the chance to map every single IP address to a single subscriber, which doesn't happen in the uh, current IPv4. So uh, also traceability, uh, probably uh, counterintuitive, but traceability reduces the need uh, to uh, have massive surveillance in uh, the telecommunication networks. So this is a good thing for the, good thing for the internet uh, privacy. Reason number two, uh, we have uh, around 4 million um, uh, internet users in the region. And uh, so far we have uh, allocated uh, roughly 190 million IP addresses. That's uh, roughly again, uh, two users have to share one internet address, but that is not the worst part. 
the, the worst part is that the internet penetration is uh, in the region is around five, 50 to 60%, depending on who you ask. To. So uh, the point is that uh, there is no more IPv4 space uh, for the other 300 million that we need to connect in the future. You can see the, the, the news in, in Guyana where uh, they have seen an increase in the uh, internet penetration. Um, uh, well, uh, even though Guyana is a very small population compared with the rest of the countries in the region, there's no more space uh, for uh, that uh, number of new internet users in Guyana. They have to share uh, the small number of resources, IPv4 resources, among among the, the, the all the um, internet users uh, currently and future. So if they have to have a good level of connectivity for all the internet users, they need and everyone needs to deploy IPv6. That's the reason number two. Reason number three, um, the growth of interconnected devices is exponential. We are not talking anymore about uh, people. We are talking now about devices. Uh, and that number of devices is growing um, uh, even uh, faster than the internet uh, uh, users. So if we want to um, uh, talk about uh, Internet of Things, smart cities, industry uh, 4.0, uh, uh, in, in industrial internet, all those things will require a massive number of internet addresses for every single device, for every single sensor that they uh, will need to interconnect to the internet. So the only uh, chance to have that promises, uh, all those promises um, uh, as, uh, 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 as, as they offer is to have IPv IPv6 deployed in our, in our networks. So the question is why our countries are so behind in uh, IPv, uh, IPv6 uh, deployment. Uh, there are some uh, recommended readings here in this uh, in these links. Uh, we conducted a, a study and analysis of this uh, uh, for, to uh, address this question back in 2016. But in short, I could I could tell you that. Uh, uh, telecom operators and internet service providers are not considering all the relevant aspects of IPv6 deployment for their businesses. Uh, so um, that's, that's the, 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 the bad news. Um, I think that if uh, they were able to consider all the relevant uh, uh, considerations uh, and, 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 barrier, uh, and uh, aspects uh, in the decision, they will be deploying IPv6 uh, already but they, they, they are not aware of those uh, uh, considerations. The good news is that uh, there is something uh, that uh, different key players can do um, to foster IPv6 deployment. And, that is, uh, and I'm not talking only about uh, businesses, I'm talking about different kind of uh, um, stakeholders. So uh, what, can, uh, what can I do? Uh, to foster IPv6 deployment? Uh, the, the, if that is the question, uh, just find you yourself in the picture. Um, uh, LACNIC can do awareness, capacity building, and training. That's the things that uh, we can do uh, to foster IPv6 deployment. But uh, we are not alone in this. Governments can do their own part. They can start uh, walking the talk, um, deploying uh, internally IPv6, for example, defining uh, internal policies to deploy IPv6, to request um, uh, services and, um, and all the uh, all relevant uh, infrastructure projects related to, to internet uh, to be compliant uh, with IPv6. Uh, they can uh, also uh, require or foster or promote industry collaboration. But governments are not alone in this. Of course, uh, we have telecom, telecom, uh, telecom operators and internet service providers. Uh, they should consider all the implications to maintain IPv4. The question is not anymore, how, how much does uh, IPv6 cost? And what can I do with IPv6 uh, that the IPv4 uh, doesn't allow me to do it? The question now is, 
uh, how much does it cost to maintain IPv4 in the long term? Additionally, academia uh, uh, has a role in this as well. They may start deploying their own IPv6 um, uh, projects and, and availability in their networks, but also they can start doing some training, some capacity building. They are the ones that will provide enough number of professionals uh, that uh, will be able to, uh, uh, to get along with all these um, uh, uh, challenges in, uh, in every country. So they have a stake in, in this. And of course, end users. Uh, if you are an end user, you may value the solutions that uh, are already in the market uh, that offers a low latency. For example, if you are a, a, a gamer, you may, uh, um, you may value uh, all uh, the, the IPv6 solutions because they will, be, they will offer you uh, better chances to have a, a better experience in your, uh, in your uh, activities. If you are an, um, uh, willing or ask, looking for security uh, video surveillance uh, solutions for your home or your business, uh, then you require uh, solutions that offer not only low latency, but also enough uh, IPv6 um, uh, availability to allocate to every single device and camera that you put in your solution for surveillance uh, of your premises. So uh, uh, once, once everyone has their own role uh, uh, attended, then we can start seeing some results in the IPv6 deployment. Um, I will not go to all the uh, details on every one of these um, um, uh, possibilities, but I will just uh, comment uh, one of them, which is, of course, uh, what can you do as a LACNIC, what uh, we have done in the, in the past. We have uh, been working with the operators to create awareness capacity and uh, capacity building, but also training since 2005, uh, 15 years now, uh, and today, uh, we are proud uh, that uh, our region has uh, the highest number of, um, uh, of uh, availability of resources, uh, IPv6. So uh, in short, if uh, an, a telecom operator of IPv6 is willing to deploy IPv6, it's very likely that they already have IPv6 deployed. So um, IPv6 deployment doesn't mean more resources to LACNIC. We already uh, allocate those resources. That means that they will have a chance to deploy more uh, services. They, that means that they will have a chance to have more customers, uh, to have more services, um, uh, to have a traceability in their network. So that's a, a better internet. Uh, and that's what we are uh, striving and aiming for with all these uh, activities. Uh, additionally, uh, I have in my presentation all the uh, ideas that uh, we have been uh, talking with some of you um, to have a better um, IPv6 uh, uh, approach uh, from the part of the government. For example, uh, we uh, suggest governments not to regulate, but rather to look for cooperation because that uh, creates less friction uh, among the uh, industry players and create a better uh, approach. Uh, it's it's uh, rather than um, looking for legal excuses to, to stop regulation, it provides a chance to look for um, solutions to deploy IPv6 in, instead of excuses. So we have found in the uh, we have found in the region that uh, when governments uh, try cooperation instead of regulation, that's a more effective and inclusive solution. More inclusive because that uh, that creates the chance to um, uh, include multiple stakeholders like, like academy. If you regulate. If you're a government regulator and you establish a new law or a regulation with strict deadlines to deploy IPv6, you cannot include in that regulation to academy, which as we see in the slides before, they have a role in all this. So we respectfully suggest you governments to consider cooperation rather than regulation as a better longer term and more effective tool. And um, you can see in this presentation, um, I, I'm going to end here, but we have uh, several ideas in how the government may uh, uh, involve, be, be involved to uh, foster IPv6 deployment. 
not only governments, but also, um, uh, also academies, let me, uh, uh, um, businesses uh, as the main players in all these uh, um, activities, they have to consider all the variables uh, and the questions and, and considerations that they need to uh, take into account uh, before they decide uh, keeping IPv4 or uh, to moving to IPv6. Um, academia, as I was mentioning, uh, they have a role as well. Uh, users, uh, you have a role uh, as well uh, if you want to uh, see IPv6 uh, be deployed uh, very soon. Um, this is the summary of uh, the uh, benefits uh, uh, of all the relevant parties in, uh, in, in the industry, in the in telecom industry. Uh, so you can find that you have a stake in, in, in these uh, efforts. And uh, th through this slides, you, you will find that you have a role uh, that uh, the, the, the things that you may do to, to foster that, that IPv6 deployment. These are some of the uh, relevant links that you may uh, find uh, relevant if, if you want to um, increase uh, IPv6 um, uh, deployment. And that would be my uh, presentation. Uh, looking for your questions in case you have some. Thank you very much, Oscar, for your presentation. Right now, we do have one question. It comes from Jai Udit from Suriname. And I guess he's looking more for a, a comment of some sort. He says, I would like to play my part, but why am I charged for an IPv6 address by my service provider? So he's referring to a different price being charged for IPv6. Uh, could you repeat the last part? Why am I charged for? IPv6 address, address space from my service provider. Mm. He's referring to a situation that he's being charged separate um, for wow. IPv6. Yeah, uh, well, uh, internet service providers already charged for IPv4. And actually, they used to charge a large amount of uh, money for those services. So this is, this is, is, uh, this is not new with IPv6. Um, the, 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 the question here is, uh, is it higher than IPv4? Because um, the ISP, uh, for sure has a lot of IPv6 addresses already uh, in uh, as opposed as the number of IPv4 addresses that, that they used to have. So um, I, I would wonder whether uh, they are charging more or it is just something that they are charging for some other services. So uh, I will have a look uh, to that. Uh, if you want to share that um, in a more de detailed um, uh, email uh, me message to us, we can try to help you with some of, uh, or rather explanations or uh, uh, links to other providers that may, may have a different um, offer to you and may have a, a, a better uh, solution for your needs. Okay, and um, thus far Jai hasn't um, given us more comments, but I'm sure he will email us soon. Uh, we don't seem to have oh yes he says he will send further details on the situation good thank you jay we don't seem to have any other questions right now so thanks once again oscar for your presentation and thank you jay for the question that you have put forward to us thank you uh, i will be around in case uh, there's uh, any other question great so now we'll continue with the second part of this webinar. The second part will be conducted by Alejandro Costa and Brent McIntosh. Go ahead, Alejandro and Brent. Okay, hello. Uh, I do have some slides. Should I present in this moment, Kevin? I believe you should, yes. Um, Put them up and I can confirm whether they can be seen or not. Okay. Okay, hope that you can see my presentation in this moment. Okay. Uh, today I'm going to talk 
about IPv6 and in somehow the strategy to proceed of, for, for the deployment. As you can see in the slide, uh, I'm going to talk to you about planning, about auditing, about creating, or at least I'm going to talk a little about an IPv6 address plan. I want to talk to you about configuring, announcing the prefix via BGP, and finally, the innovation and the tactile internet. Let's begin talking about planning. When we talk about planning, we're talking about the steps that we should follow in order to deploy V6 in this case. Okay. And the first step that all of us should begin with is auditing the network. What I mean by auditing I'm talking about checking compatibility for IPv6 in the devices. For example, suppose you want to, to implement IPv6 in your board, in your border router. You should check whether or not the device supports IPv6. And one more thing that sometimes is missed in some documentation, you should check for a specific needs that you might have. For example, suppose that this router speaks OSPF or any other routing protocol with the rest of your network, you should check whether or not this router support, supports OSPF, okay? And so on with other features that you might need. Of course, the routing area is very important, firewalls, switching, and we cannot forget about the servers. However, I can tell you with 99% of, of confidence that I'm pretty sure that your servers in any modern network supports IPv6. IPv6 is supported in many different operating systems now for over a decade. Okay, if you check Linux and previously Macintosh, Windows, all of them support in this moment IPv6 pretty well. For the second step, I would like to, to mention a little about IPv6 address plan. And what I mean by IPv6 address plan, I'm talking about having specific prefixes inside your network in different areas. Okay, something la, that will allow you to grow in a very hierarchical way and based in the best current practices. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. For example, in the network that you can see in the slide, you can see that there is a very specific prefix, 2001, DB8, FF, colon, colon, slash 40, only dedicated for infrastructure. So any new device, for example, look back, local area network for, for LAN, white area network, that you need inside your infrastructure should come from this very specific prefix. I have more examples uh, on the bottom on the slide. For example, there is a very specific network only for corporate servers. It means that in the future, you are going to have a new server. You can get an IPv6 address from this prefix. If you are, if for example, you have a network of VPSs, virtual private servers, and you are going to assign a new, you are going, you are creating a new VPS, you can take the IPv6 address from this very specific prefix, and so on for residential customers, for your Wi-Fi network, for voice over IP networks, for VPN networks, and so on, okay? Also, I want to talk a very little about configuring your network. More or less, where should you start for in case you are going to deploy IPv6? That, of course, is the, like, the, take, the take away of this of this webinar. In, we traditionally recommend to configure 
you start configuring from the edge of your network. Okay, suppose from your border router. Of course, many different networks, they have many different, well, they have many border routers, okay? For, for redundancy and things like that. Having said that, we should try to begin configuring your this router. And from this router, you can test, for example, your connectivity, you can test the prefix that you are announcing to the, to the internet and so on. Then another step, suppose everything is working, you, this step is fully done, everything is okay. You should go, for example, to your core network, okay? Like going down. Now that this one is ready, you can try to configure your core layer or your core network and test connectivity to the outside world. In this step, for example, now you might have routing protocols running among all those devices. Another step after this one is working should be like going to the aggregation layer. Of course, not all networks have the very same topology. However, what I am looking from, from this is like giving you an idea of what should be the steps that you can follow inside your network. And in the aggregation layer, it is more or less the same. You should configure this layer, trying to connect to the core layer, to your border router, testing connectivity to the outside world, testing connectivity from the outside world to your aggregation layer. And finally, the access layer. That is probably where your servers, customers are located. This should be more or less the step that you, you should follow. Of course, you do not need to, de to do this, all this in one day. For example, you can try to do your border router one day. If you have another border router, you can do it another day. Then you can move to your core layer and so on. Testing, configuring, testing, optimizing, and so on. Okay, I have mentioned announcing your prefix via BGP. What do I mean with this? This should be probably the very first step that you need to, to do to follow. You need uh, the steps to announce your prefix should be something like, you, to, you need to know which prefix you're going to advertise, of course. Uh, probably this will be the prefix given by, by us, by LACNIC, or probably given by your ISP. Then you need to ask your upstream provider to permit the prefix to permit the prefix. What is going to happen in this step is that your upstream pro provider is going to update their filters. Every, administ every BGP administrator should have filter in their networks. By default, they should not allow any other prefix than the, they know already. So when you, when you tell them, hey, sir, I have an IPv6 prefix that I need to announce. They need to, up, to update their, their filters. Then uh, we recommend to create uh, an IPv6 session that, that is the one that we're going to use to, to publish your prefix. Uh, as my first step, I have um, an optional one. However, fully recommended is to create your RPKI and IRR. These two are like security mechanisms that we fully recommend that everybody implement to make sure that their prefix is, are, are going to work in the internet very well, okay? Um, and of course the fifth step, yeah, now it is announce your prefix. And the final step should check the prefix. Is it well announced? Can I see the prefix in internet? That is like the final step. Uh, here, here I have two different examples. One for Cisco and another for Huawei. Uh, they are like, you can, depending on the vendor that you are, you are using, depending on the operating system that you are using. There are internet is, plenty full of these examples. This is one of the looking glasses. This is more or less the way that you can check 
if the if the prefix is announced or not i recommend going to euro trick they have a very popular looking glass this is basically a website where you can put the prefix you want to check and they are going to tell you in a very simple web page if the prefix is sim or not okay i have three more slides and um, i want uh, more or less mention about the innovation and IPv6. Oscar already mentioned a few things about this. I will try to go a little bit deeper, but not that much. I just want to give you the idea of why we need IPv6, why we should implement IPv6. On the top left of the current slide, you can see four different images. Uh, you can see a car, you can see a, a, a luggage, you can see a dog, and you can see a, a person. Basically, what they want to tell you with this is that in the today's world, it is very common to see cars that are already connected to the, to the internet. They connect to the internet, for example, for updating the GPS. They connect to the internet um, to to know where the other cars are. They connect to, to the internet uh, just for tracking services and so on. It, more or less, it is the same with the luggage. Uh, today is very common that the, suppose you go to an airport and you leave your luggage in, in the counter. After that, you do not know what is going to happen with the luggage. Now it is more or less common that the luggage is going to have a chip implemented and you can follow it. You can track where your luggage is. It is more or less the, more or less the same with the, with the pets, in this case with a dog. It is more or, less, more or less the same with a person. Another one that I believe is quite important, uh, and I am a believer that IPv6 is going to take an enormous part in this area, is agriculture and more for example today it is very common in a farm to have a lot of sensors around the farm so for the people for the farmer it is easy to know if everything is okay if there is a lot of wind if there is a lot of rain humidity uh, heat or cold and they can take advantage of that information to know if the job is okay if it is time to, to, to take, for example, whatever, the apples, the peaches, the, whatever I have in, in, in my farm. And it is the same with the cattle. Uh, regarding the cattle, I, have a, a, I really like because we have already seen experiences in, in, the, in our region, specifically in Costa Rica. It is very common to implement a chip, a chip inside a cow and you can know if the cow is moving you can check the vitals the vitals of the cow the heart rate the temperature of the cow if the cow is moving or not and having said that regarding for example the farm regarding the cows i believe that ipv6 is going to reduce the poverty and even the starvation in the world because we are going to be more productive. We are going to, to lose less agriculture. We're going to less, less, less fruit. Less. So uh, I believe that IPv6 is going to, get, to take a great part in agriculture and, and cattle. It is more, I'm talking more, I'm going to, to go faster. Uh, for example, energy consumption. I believe that IPv6 is going to take a great part reducing the energy consumption worldwide. Today, it's very common to see a smart buildings and they know what to do with the lights, what to do with the water. When, when, when certain things happen, so the, the building is going to be more, but it's going to be smarter. And therefore, we will get an energy consumption. Uh, Oscar already mentioned security surveillance and talking about this one more time, I am a believer that IPv6 is going to, 
to reduce or to increase the security in a city because with IPv6, it is much easier to have more cameras to implement more surveillance and having doing so, you will get, you will increase the security and the safety of the population in, 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 your, in your city. It is more or less the same with building management and going to save, to save energy, even water in, in the building. Uh, I'm going to skip a uh, medicine because in the next slide I have a few things about that. Um, regarding medicine, I want to talk a little about tactile internet. This is what is going to be the future. This is a concept and this is, in this moment is not that common. However, I believe that it will get more, it will be, become more popular in the close future. On your top left, for example, you can see someone who is having a surgery being performed by a robot. It is, sounds like a little bit crazy. However, I, I guess that many of you have seen this already in certain clinics and hospital. And I guess that this, this is going to be, a, to be, will be more common every day or at least every month. The, the good things about this is that robot, robots can, be, can, can handle certain things much better than even humans. And the most relevant part is that I can have the robot being managed remotely by a very expert, experienced doctor. Suppose that this person needs a very specific surgery and the doctor is not in place so it needs to be performed from very far away, maybe from another city or from another country. This is where the tactile internet takes part. And I have another image here from virtual reality or augmented reality. This is going to be the, the future. Uh, all of us can, can trust about this. Uh, you can see also a, manu uh, a manufacturer here. Uh, there are many different arms that are being managed or at least controlled or monitored by someone who has a, a tablet connected probably to a Wi-Fi network. Having said all of this, all of these need an IP address and that IP address is going to be an IPv6 address. Um, more things, for example, in this moment you have one more time a robot which is in checking up uh, a patient uh, in the next in the next picture, you have more or less the same uh, a robot who is checking up, checking the vitals of this person, the heart rate, temperature, and much more. Um, everything related with money, the augmented reality is going to be part of all this. And well, and so on. The examples are infinite, so I cannot mention all of that all of them in one moment. But uh, to summarize tactile internet, tactile internet refers to a lot of bandwidth, a lot of bandwidth, uh, very fast networks. Uh, and when I mention fast, I am talking about a very small round trip time. So suppose a packet that goes and packet that returns, and it is going to be very fast. And the packet loss should be almost null there should not be packet lost in a tactile ne network. And finally, I want to mention the risk of not deploying IPv6. Uh, the first one that I want to mention is, uh, for example, the development of new networks uh, will be hindered if IPv6 is not deployed and not having new networks is very bad for the future of any country. Uh, the second one is, a point, an item that I really believe it should be taken in consideration by all of us is the digital inclusion, inclusion of the of the people. If we check in this moment the penetration rate of the internet in our region, we will notice that the penetration rate is about fifty five percent. So it means that there are still forty five percent of the Latin American people including the Caribbean, that is not connected to the internet. If we want to connect 
this missing 45%, we should do it with IPv6. We cannot do it with IPv4. It would be like a crazy thing to do. Um, the, the same for the new applications. If we do not deploy IPv6, the new application will be hindered. And unfortunately, new application will not appear. And if we check the current internet, it is very different if we compare it with 10 years, 15 or 20 years ago. And it will be very different from the internet that we will know in 15 or 20 years from now. Um, unfortunately, if we do not deploy IPv6, things like NAT, NAT means network address translation, will gain more popularity. And that unfortunately breaks applications and brings a lot of error errors and makes our networks more expensive to handle or to manage. Uh, at, uh, in the end, uh, the cost of not deploying IPv6 will be higher than implementing IPv6. So the idea place is to move forward and deploy IPv6. And this is all what I have in this moment, Kevin, I do not know if there are many questions. Hi, Alejandro. Yes, we have two questions. The first one comes from Jose Rubina. He asks, what percentage of CDNs have deployed IPv6 with the preferred, sorry, this is the second part, would the preferred IPv6 deployment be dual stack or is it safe to consider 100% IPv6 deployment? Well, so hello, Jose, and thanks a lot for your question. Excuse me, Kevin? No, proceed. I was repeating the question. Okay, perfect. Uh, well, Jose, uh, thanks for your question. I appreciate it. And I, am, I really like to receive questions. Regarding the percentage of CDNs that have deployed the PV6, the number is quite high. I can only think in one CDN that have not deployed IPv6. Uh, I'm going to give you examples. Probably I will be missing one. Uh, for example, Akamai, they already deployed v6. Uh, Google it deployed IPv6 in their CDNs. Netflix deployed IPv6. Facebook deployed IPv6. Uh, and I can tell you one more thing regarding CDNs. I know that the CDNs like Akamai, Cloudflare, Google, they do not like to put devices in POPs, in point of, point of present, in networks that do not support IPv6. Because the CDNs, they are, very, they are a power user of the synchronization of the data with the main servers. To do the synchronizations over IPv, IPv4 is a headache for them. And it, 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 they commonly fail. So they prefer to put CDN devices in networks that support IPv6. Uh, well, one more, one more time, I already mentioned Facebook, Akamai, Cloudflare, Netflix. The only one that I am aware that do not support IPv6 is Twitter. I do not know why. I do not want to, 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 to guess any hypothesis, but they do not support. Unfortunately, they do not support IPv6. All the rest, all the rest, believe me, they do support IPv6. And regarding the second part of your question, which, uh, can you repeat the, la the, the last part of the question, Kevin, please? Certainly. He asked, uh, what would, would they prefer IPv6 deployment be dual stack or is it safe to consider 100% IPv6? Oh, okay. Excellent. Oh, well, Jose, there is not uh, one size fits all. Um, unfortunately, before giving you an answer, it would be nice to, to check your network, what you have, uh, the topology of your network, what kind of network do you administer. It is not the same, for example, a mobile network than a data center. They are very different. However, traditionally speaking, in some moment, you will need IPv4, okay? Uh, please consider that. If you decide like an, an IPv6 only network, there will be some moment in your network, some part of your network that you will need IPv4. Why? Because not everybody supports IPv6. Uh, 
And the other question, uh, Kevin, you mentioned. Certainly, we have another question from Ricky Mahabir from Suriname. He asks, is it known or do you know what percentage of currently used manufactured mobile phones, tablets already support IPv6? Uh, yes, I, I believe I, I do know the, the number, and the number is 100%. It is not something about hardware. It is in traditionally, traditionally speaking, we are talking about software. And in this moment, every tablet and cell phone support IPv6. To give you a specific information, for example, iOS from Apple, they, they support IPv6 since decades. It is more or less the same case with Android. They support IPv6. Uh, and I, well, I, I guess they are 99.99% 99 .99 of, the, of the market. Android and iOS, both of them support IPv6. Um, I, I hope I answered your, your question, Ricky, and thank you for, for it. Great. And Alejandro, I'm just picking up on a comment from Gwendel Trudeman from Suriname as well. I think it's related to what Jose was asking. Um, he says that the problem is, not that, is that not all sources are IPv6 enabled. So it's, yeah, not all sources are IPv6 enabled. I don't know if you want to add any further questions to that. Any further comment? Mm, uh, not, not, not really. Probably the sources are the, the, the customers, the end users. Probably she's referring to that. Okay. But thank you for the comment. Great. And yes, Alejandro, that's all the questions we have for now. Well, thank you. Uh, I will be here. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you very much, Alejandro. And at this juncture, we'll go straight into the presentation to be done by Brent McIntosh. Welcome, Brent. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, and good afternoon to everyone here. You know, uh, let me say um, Oscar's and Alejandro's presentations were excellent, and excellent in the sense that it's actually going to help me in my presentation. I'm a guest speaker for LACNIC today, so it's a good thing because I get to do what I want and see what I want. Um, just kidding. But anyway, just to give you an idea, um, you know, on, in terms of IPv6 strategy and what we have seen in the Caribbean, um, and I'm going to speak a lot about what's happening in the Caribbean region before I show you just a little bit of, you know, uh, the things that Alejandro spoke about, and um, just to make it make sense for those who have not dived deep into uh, IPv6 deployment as yet. I have had the opportunity to work on IPv6 uh, since 2009 as an end user, testing end user. I've worked on I ISP transit deployments, on ISP uh, B2B customer deployments for IPv6, CDN deployments. Um, so I was happy when Alejandro spoke about you know, the CDNs that supports uh, IPv6, and most of them do. Um, I've had the opportunity to work on Google V6 deployments, Netflix, Facebook, and um, Cloudflare as well, and Akamai. Um, and also from the uh, enterprise customer perspective, um, formerly I worked as a you know as an engineer at an ISP, but now I work as a consultant, um, especially helping uh, large enterprises with uh, things like multi-homing, high availability, and you know, the thing is, they are to date requesting support and uh, building out their networks for with IPv6. And if I go to segment, you know, the sectors that are really focusing on IPv6, and, you know, it will seem weird because that's actually the finance sector. And that's a sector that's usually the most uh, worried and scared about deploying something that has full public access and there's no NATS anymore. Um, but that's what we're seeing. Um, we're seeing um, more enterprises applying for ASNs, both in the LACNIC and the ARIN region. Um, we're seeing them also requesting their you know, IPv6 space as well. So let me just uh, share my screen. Um, and if I can take you to maybe, yeah, for example, in, if you are seeing this page currently, um, let me just share a little bit here. This 
what you're seeing here is um, sort of a you know a, you know a documented database of IPv6 allocations. Um, specifically for this country, Grenada, the country which I live in, you would see IPv6 allocations for here maybe five providers. Um, and if you pay attention to the prefixes, right, you would see one particular ISP is using a slash 28 prefix. Now that's a lot of address space maybe for a country that has only 110,000 persons. But why is that, right? Now Alejandro spoke about address planning. And, and I want to sort of home in on that because part of your strategy and the most important, one of the most important parts of your strategy is understand what you'll be addressing and how many networks. You know, we, we no longer look at IPv6 in terms of um, end user uh, addresses or how many end users, you know, or how many devices in the home. That's fine, you know, we cover that, but we tend to look at it more from the number of networks. So this allocation here, that's slash 28, right, which represents, I believe, uh, you know, maybe uh, 32 slash uh, 32s, um, 16 slash 32s. That address space was selected based on proper address planning. And, and this particular uh, client or customer happens to be one of the large ISPs here in Grenada. Um, most times we find end users, they tend to just take the default space that either LACNIC or ARIN, um, you know, um, you know, provides. And the default mask, I think, is a slash 32 for ISPs and a slash 40 for enterprises, right? But what we try to, you know, focus on is ensuring that you do proper uh, planning. And that was a very good point. I was happy to see that. Now, um, I'm just going to take you through a little bit again. Um, Alejandro would have touched on all the technical parts. So I'm just going to do some demos so you can actually see. Um, so let's look a little bit at IXPs, right? Um, you're looking at a parent DB um, a page for the Grenada Internet Exchange. I chose this one because this one is sort of close to my heart because you know we've spent a lot of time since you know 2011 trying to build this exchange. Right? And um, if you look, you know, you would see uh, that pretty much all of the providers here, almost all, I believe, um, or pretty much most of them, are actually connected at IPv6 uh, just as as with IPv4. And um, there are two CDNs you can see here, Akamai, of course, they're V6 as well. And, uh, um, and that's, I think there is Cloudflare that should be here at AS1335. That is also uh, connected at IPv6. Now, and Alejandro made a great point that CDNs sort of provide, uh, you know, their traffic more, uh, their content more efficiently over IPv6. And there's always a preference for them to use IPv6. Um, you know, at, at, at home as well, for me, if, if, if I'm connected to home at, at, at dual stack, my connection would most times prefer, um, you know, an IPv6 connection if available. So I just want to now just switch to this presentation here, again, to give you an idea. Um, and there, this, I believe, would have been maybe in 2018. Um, I was testing, I was testing IPv6 uh, uh, connectivity at home um, from my service provider. And uh, you know, if you look, you know, I didn't take the snapshot of the number of IPv4 flow sessions as compared to IPv6, but within the first five minutes, you know, with the kids at home browsing and and, and doing stuff on the internet, it, it ramped up to 364 sessions for IPv6. Um, you know, and you know, did a little speed test because there are no lo local speed test servers available as yet for V6. But you know, I mean, this was a you know a hundred meg connection, and um, you know, I got nine megs. But this is just this is just for you to understand that the protocol, you know, it's really efficient and and it works. So the second proof of concept we did at that time um, while we were testing V6 uh, was to deploy Wi-Fi at a school. Um, you know, that house, that school maybe housed maybe 400, 400 students. And the reason we selected that school is because that school is, a, you know, private school, you know, every parent would buy a, a, a mobile device for their kids because, you know, they like to be in touch, you know, to, you know, to pick them up on time. Um, so that, that school was the perfect testing scenario. Um, you know, when we looked at the traffic from the Wi-Fi interface that was on, uh, you know, coming into a native V6 gateway, 
uh, end users were assigned IPs by two means, uh, DHCP v6, uh, stateless, stateful. Um, and when we look at most of the destination, of course, mostly everyone got v6 uh, by um, DHCP v6. But most of the destinations were all IPv6. They were all selected, you know, and there were things like uh, Google, Facebook, Instagram, and these were all, you know, selected via IPv6, right? And I, I'm just showing you this to show you how much efficient the protocol is and how much it makes sense, right? Um, so I'm going to touch a little bit on something else now. Um, let me just let me just log on to. Uh, uh, should have. Um, a device that's connected to the internet that is dual stacked. Now, one of the questions we normally get is, okay, um, well, you know, I'm no longer using NAT and I'm concerned about security. And, you know, we spend quite a bit of time explaining that, you know, NAT is not necessarily, it's not necessarily, NAT is not a form of security, right? Uh, with IPv6 on firewalls, you know, the policy, the same policies apply, you know, pretty much your policies for your internal, your external trust on trust zones, it's the same methodology. And, and I guess Alejandro could probably, uh, you know, sort of keep me honest on this, but pretty much these are the same policies you apply. So here, I just want to show you that I have a, a, a you know, a secure gateway um, that is dual stack. I'm just going to touch a little bit now on the. Let's look at the sessions. The combination of sessions. These are the total sessions: IPv4 plus IPv6 sessions, 483. I'm just going to select IPv6, and it's pretty much one third of these sessions are v6 sessions. Um, and this is at home. Um, my wife, who is a poor user, my son is a poor user. You know, they're not online now. Um, you know, but once they're online, you would see the number of sessions really ramp up. And I'm actually running, I'm actually running, uh, you know, a dual ones scenario. Um, one at 100 megs. Actually, there are 200 meg connections, but there's only one that's 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 dual stacked at the moment. And you know, I set it up to always be the primary link. And at times you can see this ramp up to maybe five, 6,000 sessions. Most of it are being IPv6, depending on what's being done. Um, so I'm gonna move on now to looking at, uh, you know, uh, sort of AS path, um, you know, propagation for V6. Now, once you apply for your, your you did your address planning, then you have applied for your ESN, you applied for your correct uh, allocation or prefix for your unicast address for V6. Um, and then you pair upstream, you know, you want to see, uh, you know, what your pair would look like. Alejandro mentioned Hurricane Electric BGP Toolkit, excellent place to go to look at stuff. Um, you know, uh, this is, you know, this is one, for one, one, one scenario with a service provider here. Um, you know, this is what their propagation looks like for V6. Um, but this is not really, you know, a fully multi-homed um, ISP or downstream customer, but this again gives you an idea. I mean, you can look at the different pairings, um, right? This is, this is IPv6 pairs compared to IPv4. It's, you know, not, I mean, not much more. And this, this goes to show that the, the drive for getting uh, customers uh, IPv6, you know, connected IPv6 ready in the curb is, is uh, really, you know, it's really growing. Um, I can probably look at, maybe let me look at another customer. Uh, uh, this is this is a multi-home enterprise customer. Um, let's just look at their V6 uh, propagation. Now this customer was multi-home, um, but their, you know, what happened is that the ISP they were multi-home with uh, the multi-home and ISP, the primary ISP, you know, acquired the other one. So they went from being multi-homed into single home, or well, say multi-homed into dual home. So they have two physical connections, but now it's single ES because one one uh, one company acquired the other one. So things like that happen. Um, so you know, now this customer has to relook their parent strategy for the IPv6. 
Now, critical, you know, and, and Alejandro mentioned this as an option, and actually it is an option. But what I am seeing to date is uh, RPKI, you know, being part of, you know, your integration strategy and into ensuring that, you know, your, your routes are originated from the AS that they should only come from. So, you know, you're now seeing enterprises and, and providers in, and I'm talking from the Caribbean perspective, really trying to integrate uh, in RPKI into the, you know, the BGP deployment. Um, so I'm just showing you an example here um, of a, a local V6 prefix that is actually being shown as, as valid. Um, you know, this has the, this road has been signed um, using, uh, you know, Aaron's online hosted RPKI. I have been looking and will be working on my first RPKI uh, deployment um, for a customer that's using LACNIC resources. And I'm really looking forward to that. Um, as a matter of fact, just to compare, you know, the, the ease of deployment. So um, I hope uh, next time I can share a little bit on that. Now, at, at, at home again, um, you know, it doesn't matter the operating system. And I was really glad that someone asked a question on, you know, the, the, the number of devices that, that supports IPv6 um, in terms of mobile. Um, from an OS perspective, most phones run either Android and then, of course, Apple um, with, with uh, you know, Mac OS. And um, I wish I had put in a couple of slides to show you that the testing that we've done successfully um, on the Wi-Fi interface, um, not the LTE interfaces though, on, on, uh, you know, with IPv6. And those worked seamlessly, excellent on Android, ex excellent on, 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 on Apple. I know in some cases, and, you know, I have not been tracking the development of, of the operating systems and how well the, the IPv6 is configured or how seamless is configured. But I know some, some years ago, some only supported uh, stateless DHCPv6, you know, some supported Slack, but no, I believe there's full support for stateful DHCP v6. Um, I'm still pending, and that's that's a limitation on the providers here. But I'm still pending the testing deployment of IPv6 um, on LTE in, in, in the faces. Um, I've tested here on uh, on Apple. You know, this is a, this is stateful DHCP v6 on my laptop at home, um, and this this works pretty well. And of also, you know, to, to you know, it's it's. I think one of the challenges that you would face, well, not face, but Alejandro again touched on it, and I'll keep going back to Alejandro's presentation because he really put the critical things in place there, right? In terms of your audit, uh, if you have not started your audit as yet, it's very important that you do, um, because what you'll find, while you may have uh, support for IPv6 on 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 most of your devices, you know. Um, they may have limitations, there may be bugs. So it's actually good to have an audit um, with a proper audit file specifying the hardware, date of purchase, and I know the product cycle, life cycle, current operating system, what is supposed IPv6, what are the limitations, right? Because you'll find whether you're an enterprise or an ISP, you need critical things like, um, you know, uh, uh, support for IPv6 support with OSPF v3, uh, you know, BGP4 and stuff like that. Um, I have here, you know, a firewall. And to be honest, you know, you may be seeing a lot of uh, this operating system. I mean, I'm I'm not here to, you know, to you know support or, or or market any particular hardware, right? But what we test a lot with in the lab is uh, Cisco iOS, is, uh, Juniper, Junos, and uh, Fortigate, FortiOS, Palo Alto, PanOS. Um, but today it was so convenient for me to actually have, um, you know, a, a, a Fortigate device to, to demonstrate this. So I just want to show you something. Uh, so I'm just looking at the uh, BGP table. This this uh, particular device have a couple of BGP pairs. Um, this have a external BGP pairs pair. Um, you know, um, and this is a number of prefixes that has been received on that that uh, BGP uh, neighbor session. Um, I'm just gonna do a quick ping to uh, make, let's say, um, maybe Yahoo. 
something we don't use too often, right? Um, and uh, let's see if I can do a trace route. Maybe to lacnic.net. Okay, um, so let me see. Commands, uh, commands really vary uh, with this, this operating system. So let me try to see if I have this right. Yeah, and there we go. So that trace looks like it's actually going out to Lacnic. So yeah, so again, it doesn't matter the device uh, really and truly, um, you know, you know this the particular device here, um, let's see if I can access it. Just one second. This should be running Cisco iOS. Okay, let's do uh, maybe Okay, so I'm just not, this device should have both uh, IPv4, IPv6 connectivity. So let me just ping uh, something. Um, and by default, look, it selected IPv6 first, right? And that's just going back to the same point. The devices are, you know, will always, you know, these routing devices would always prefer IPv6, IPv4, over IPv4. Pretty similar with uh, happy eyeballs and so with, with your web browsers. Um, so let me just uh, do a, maybe a trace. A trace road. I'm not. I'm not even going to specify trace road IPv6. I'm just going to say trace road to let's say lacnic again, lacnic.net. Yeah, and there we go. So you know, again, I I wish I had a lot of time to re really go through different things with you, but um, I just wanted to give you the feel that you know these things you know re really do work. You know, with, as far as IPv6 is concerned, you know, so. The idea of testing and, and, and trying stuff uh, is really, it's, it's really good. Um, but getting following the guidelines that Alejandro gave in terms of ensuring your audit is done, ensuring you actually do a proper address plan. So you only go to LACNIC once. Yes, and I am saying once because um, when I worked for uh, a Caribbean ISP, we went to LACNIC twice for the same business unit. Um, you know, when we really didn't do a address plan the way it should have been and realized that we needed not a slash 30, but actually a slash 24. A lot of space, but yeah, I'm talking about for a country that was running, uh, uh, you know, uh, believe a population of 1.3 million people. And um, in total, maybe almost 500,000 broadband subs. Kevin, that country should sound very familiar to you. <laughs> so again, you know, these are the things I, I really want to sort of stress on. And I, I just want to, you know, speak a little bit about um, challenges. And I always tend to end my presentations with, with, with challenges. And why challenges? Because they're always a, a quite a bit, especially in the IPv6 realm in deployment planning. First challenge, and this is from my personal experience, but from speaking with other engineers and architects, they have seen the same thing. Upper management executive teams need to understand the business value. Um, and Oscar, Oscar and, and Alejandro spoke to things that would, would be good sellers of IPv6 deployments. Um, the challenge you have is that upper management doesn't all the time understand from the technical perspective and how efficient web browsing and accessing mobile content will be, what they see is dollars and cents. Um, so you need to be able to understand how to you know, you know, sell why you need to move to IPv6. Um, so that's one challenge. Uh, you know, another challenge, well, CGNAT works fine, IPv4 works fine, yes, but you know, we're literally out of IPv4 address, address space. Um, so let me, just before I talk about the space, let me chat on CGNAT. CGNAT, you know, uh, I'm from a cost perspective. I've done an analysis for one company, um, one ISP, and they were spending annually on just on their CGNAT OPEX they were spending around almost half a million dollars, half a million US dollars on carrier grade NAT. Now, when I look at the, 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 the cost analysis and, and the planning for IPv6, it was not even gonna be a quarter of that, right? And again, that's a good selling point, you know? And the challenge with CG NAT is that, you know, you constantly have to pay support fees and I've constantly seen, um, you know, these sort of uh, 
break in session flows at times um, when you know you would have issues with a uh, provider and you know 300,000 100,000 customers would be down and you say okay uh, are these customers running CGNet are they on CGNet uh, network yes they are okay right and, and then so you lose you lose uh, you, the thing is not just that you lose money but your customers lose trust right um, I always believe in a secure end-to-end -end, uh, uh, you know connectivity solution and that's what IPv6 brings to the table it brings connectivity for everyone but I'm I'm telling you things that you already know but again it's it's so hard not to sort of re-emphasize those points. Um, so that's one thing on CGNet. And in terms of depletion, well, it's only now hitting home. We always knew about depletion, but it's really hitting home now. Um, this week, I got a call from a client. Um, we need to do a multi-home solution um, in another location. It's, it's, it, it's not going to be V6 as yet, but we want to do V4 first, then V6. Okay, then, well, the problem is um, we can do that solution, but you'll have to apply for another IPv4 block. And what's the problem? You know, there's no more IPv4, right? So now we have to relook uh, v6, of course, using uh, translation. Um, and the reason we're using translation because all the services wouldn't be on v6 as yet, as, um, you know, as, as Alejandro would have mentioned. But at the same time, you know, had this been taken into consideration, from specific customers maybe five years ago when we were speaking a lot about this then it would have cost them less and it would have been less headache to do that deployment now so but you know you can only understand when you have to understand <laughs> and, and that's the challenge but you know i think this lacnic session here would really help you know you know get that message out so i will leave a few minutes questions um if any um but you know this is my contribution today I'm really hoping that I can get another opportunity to come back and speak to you more on and, and show you more stuff, um, you know, not just from home usage, but from, from ISPs and from, you know, large enterprise customers who are really, in my opinion, moving fast in getting their IPv6 deployment out of the gate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brent. We have one, custom, one question uh, right now. It comes from Jose Urbina. He asks, Based on your experience working within the Caribbean, what are some of the actions or incentives you have seen regional regulators have taken to stimulate IPv6 deployment? Great question. Um, I usually get this question on almost every seminar. Um, now, so what I've seen, um, I, I haven't seen much of like a, a sort of a incentive based stimulus to move forward. What I've seen is, you know, regulators, you, meeting with, you know, their charge, well, meeting with their ISPs um, and trying to push deployment of IPv6 and um, IXPs pretty much in parallel, right? They're saying, you know what, guys, we need to build out an IXP. You need to connect, you know, you know, you know, you need to move to V6. This is the situation. And what I've noticed is that, you know, these messages come from the regulator because they're being pushed by, you know, higher bodies, um, you know, you know, maybe they got Governing Bob Union, RN, LACNIC, ISOC, and these are the great uh, communities out there. So uh, regulators are feeling the pressure to get their, you know, the ISPs or, the, or the, the entities they regulate to actually, you know, move to IPv6 and move to deploying internet exchange points where you can easily uh, help ramp up your IPv6 deployment. Um, so in terms of incentives, um, I would say the only incentive right now I'm seeing is that they're really trying to be more like a partner in these deployments and not really like a, a regulator. And the, I can tell you for the case of uh, BVI, in the case of of Grenada, you know, um, uh, the case of, 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 of Suriname, and I'll talk about Suriname a lot on this, right? I think you know Suriname is a great example of a regulator really trying to work with providers, not just as a regulator, but more so as a partner. They are doing all the heavy lifting. They are make they are facilitating stuff, you know, to, to make to make it even easier for the the the, the ISPs. So, but I, I this is a great question because maybe you know this is something maybe we need to think of um, from an incentive based uh, you know perspective, if that's even possible from a regulator's point of view working along with LACNIC and Aaron and so to help move this forward. But I would definitely take a note of this because this is a really great question. 
hope I hope I at least help with something on that one. Great, thanks, Brent. And Brent, and this is me commenting. So I would say that your observations dovetail well with what Oscar had recommended. That is really about cooperation, 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 uh, especially in terms of the regulator and the ISPs and the entire community, um, academia, especially for knowledge about uh, V sixty five. Um, I don't see any other questions right now. Um, I'm not certain if anyone has any final comments that they would like to give. Brent, Alejandro, Oscar. Great. No comments. And, okay, wonderful. And if that is the case, I'd like to thank you, Brent, Alejandro, and Oscar, for your wonderful presentations again here today. I want to remind everyone that this recording of the webinar will be published on the coming days on the LACNIC webinars page. And thanks to all of you, the attendees, for joining us here today for this webinar on IPv6 as a strategy for the future development of the region. Be sure to follow our social networks and mailing lists to find out more about the coming activities and upcoming initiatives. And without further ado, do have a great rest of your afternoon. Goodbye, everyone.